Well, in this time of pandemic, it's wonderful that we can nourish mind and soul. And so we pray. Almighty and eternal God, our refuge in every danger, to whom we turn in our distress and faith, we pray. Look with compassion on the afflicted, grant eternal rest to the dead, comfort to mourners, healing to the sick, peace to the dying. Strength to healthcare workers, wisdom to our leaders, and the courage to reach out to all in love, so that together we may give glory to your holy name. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, hello and welcome to the online version of our lecture today. My name is Nick Zumerum from the Institute for Ethics and Society at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. And we're one of the partnering institutions on the scholarship at the Cathedral Project, along with Campion College, University Chaplaincies, and of course, the Catholic Archdiocese of Sydney. For those of you who haven't heard about the initiative, we usually run a public lecture series at St. Mary's Cathedral. And we bring together intellectuals from different backgrounds and interests to share and seek truth together on matters of faith and reason. And this is the first lecture for 2020. We're very grateful to be bringing you the lecture in this online format, of course, given the situation with COVID-19 and our prayers are with those most affected by the virus. Our guest today is a local guest, uh, James Franklin, is Honorary Professor of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales where he has taught mathematics since 1981 and served many years as professor of mathematics. He's also adjunct professor in the Institute for Ethics and Society at Notre Dame in Sydney and editor of the Journal of the Australian Catholic Historical Society. Professor Franklin's a prolific author. His books include Corrupting the Youth, A History of Philosophy in Australia, An Aristotelian Realist Philosophy of Mathematics, What Science Knows and How It Knows It, and Catholic Values and Australian Realities. He was awarded the 2005 ACU Eureka Prize for research in ethics, partly for research on the parallels between mathematics and ethics. His current work is on the worth of persons as the foundational concept in ethics. Professor Franklin will present on mathematics and ethics, the two sciences with demonstrable truths, and we will see you shortly as we pick up Q&A with Professor Franklin. Thank you. This talk has just two main ideas. The first one is that mathematics and ethics are very alike, and they're unlike the range of other sciences from physics to ornithology to sociology. Mathematics and ethics are about eternal, necessary truths accessible to pure reason. Other sciences need observation, measurement, and experiment for reason to work on. You need to get out into the wet to find the facts in the empirical sciences. Not so in mathematics and ethics. That was an idea familiar to Plato. He advised that the future rulers of the state should have extensive training in mathematics to fit their minds for an appreciation of the good. That idea has gone off the boil since then. Let's see why we should revive it. Let's start with five minutes on mathematics. I say five minutes so that any math phobics in the audience would have a time horizon to look forward to. But my intention is that you follow exactly what I say. The examples are simple, but revealing. Mathematics is not fundamentally about rules and formulas. If your memory of mathematics at school is all rules and formulas, that's unfortunate. Nor is it about what to do. Plato makes fun of those who think that mathematics is about what to do because they hear mathematicians talking about actions, like adding, subtracting, extracting square roots and extending lines. True, mathematics does have some rules, formulas, and actions, but those are peripheral matters of technique. They're not what mathematics is really about. Here's an example of what mathematics is really about, a classic from the 18th century. The citizens of Königsberg in northeastern Europe 
often walked over the bridges of their city as in the diagram. Top and bottom are the banks of the river, there are two islands in the middle, and seven bridges connecting the four land areas as shown. The citizens found that it was very difficult to walk over all the bridges once without walking over at least one of them twice. You try it. The great mathematician Leonard Euler studied the problem. He proved that the citizen's hunch was right. It's impossible to walk over all the bridges just once. That's an impossibility, a proved impossibility, not about some abstract model or idealization, but about the real arrangement of bridges in the real city. Now that is mathematics. Here's a second example. A simpler one. Consider th two rows of three stars, one above the other. That's two times three equals six stars. Now consider them as three columns of two. That's three times two. It's the same lot of stars, just divided into parts differently. So we see that two times three equals three times two. Indeed, we see not only that two times three is in fact 3 times 2, but that 2 times 3 must be 3 times 2. That's a necessary truth, and one that applies to the very physical stars in front of us. Here's a last example for you to do in your mind's eye, or what used to be called the imagination before poets took over that term. Imagine a wooden cube painted all over. Now, divide it in three in each direction, in each vertical direction and horizontally. First, how many little cubes are there? There's three by three by three equals 27. Here's a picture. Now here's the more difficult question. How many of those little cubes are painted on exactly two sides? Okay, I'll give you back the picture to make it easier. It's 12. One in the middle of each edge. Four on the top, four down the sides, four on the bottom. That's a necessary truth that you can come to know just by visualizing. What we learn from these mathematical examples is that there exists a world of necessities, understandable by pure thought, that constrains what happens in the real world, the physical, non-abstract world. That attunes our minds to the necessities of ethical reality as we'll see. Plato says, what we have to consider is whether the greater and more advanced part of mathematics tends to facilitate the apprehension of the idea of good. That tendency, we affirm, is to be found in all studies that force the soul to turn its vision round to the region where dwells the most blessed part of reality, which it is imperative that we should behold. Plato says too, what exactly it is about mathematics that helps with ethics. It's the act of understanding which leads the mind to contemplate the intelligible realities that stand behind appearance. Next, ethics. Ethics is not fundamentally about formulas or rules. If your memory of ethics from school or church is all formulas and rules, that's unfortunate. Nor is ethics fundamentally about what to do, though part of it is. That's a controversial thing to say, certainly. I'll explain. It's not unusual to think that ethics is by definition 
about what you ought to do. Peter Singer writes, for example, Ethics is about how we ought to live, what makes an action the right rather than the wrong thing to do, what should our goals be. Unlike some of his other ethical views, that is mainstream. So traditionally, ethics has not often been understood as the study of an independently existing objective subject matter the way mathematics has been. Ethics has been taken to be just about actions, their rightness, their obligatoriness, which are duties and which are permitted, which are virtuous, etc. Even realist ethical philosophies that take it to be an objective matter what is right and wrong, like Kantian universalizability or natural law or classical utilitarianism, say that it's really actions or action-oriented virtues that exhibit moral qualities such as rightness. We need to stand back from those particular theories and get the big picture of ethics. Some of you may be fans of the P.G. Woodhouse stories. They're about the young aristocrat Bertie Wooster, who's not the sharpest tool in the shed, and his smooth butler Jeeves. In each story, Bertie gets into a scrape which Jeeves has to extract him from. In the very first story, where Bertie and Jeeves meet, the problem is that Bertie has got engaged to a young lady who is totally unsuitable. This is Florence in the original illustration. Her unsuitability is revealed in the passage where Bertie says, she was particularly keen on boosting me up a bit nearer her own plane of intellect. She was a girl with a wonderful profile it's steeped to the gills in serious purpose. I can't give you a better idea of the way things stood than by telling you that the book she'd given to me to read was called Types of Ethical Theory. Now, Types of Ethical Theory is not an invention of Woodhouse. It's a real book, written by James Martineau and published in 1885. Not a bad book, too though I wouldn't recommend its prose style. It says that there are essentially two types of ethical theory. I adapt his theory somewhat, but not too much. The first type of ethical theory, spoiler alert, the wrong type, Martineau calls psychologic, and we might now call naturalist. It thinks of ethics as primarily evolved and learned patterns of thinking and behaviour which serve some societal purpose. It often begins with some Darwinian fairy tale about how primitive societies needed to develop altruistic behaviour so there was enough cooperation for the survival of the tribe. Then it's supposed that sentiments of approval and disapproval train people in how to follow the customs of the tribe, ensuring tribal cohesion. In Annette Bayer's phrase, it thinks of ethics as traffic rules for self-asserters. I wonder, could you have a psychologic or naturalist theory of mathematics? You might say that arithmetic behavior must have evolved too. We need to do accountancy since some of us owe the king more sheep than others, and we make up rules to help us do that. Or maybe the king makes up the rules for us. There is actually a book called A Social Constructivist Philosophy of Mathematics, but it's an uphill battle. The reason is you understand that accountancy practice must follow the pre-existing laws of arithmetic, not the other way round. Arithmetic is just how it is, with numbers and addition. So it's normative for the actions of accountancy and is itself neither essentially normative nor about actions. Nor could it have evolved differently. Some tribes have developed more mathematics than others, but not mathematics that contradicts other tribes' mathematics. The other kind of ethical theory, the good one, says that there's an external standard that evolved behaviours must be held to. 
Not every evolved behaviour has the rosy glow of altruism, rape and genocide for example. Genghis Khan is estimated to have some 16 million living descendants, so rape and genocide certainly work for him, evolutionarily speaking. But according to a non-naturalist view of ethics, that does nothing to make those behaviours right. Now, any properly objectivist theory of ethics, such as Kantian or natural law theory, says that there's an external standard that personal or tribal behaviours must conform to. But the purest form of objectivist ethics compares it much more closely with mathematics as a pure science of necessities. Here we come to the second main idea of the talk. I said at the beginning that the first main idea was that mathematics and ethics were alike. Now we come to the second idea, which is needed to appreciate the first. That idea is that ethics is not fundamentally about what to do. There are two basic reasons for thinking that. Firstly, what we are most disturbed by ethically, what most violently forces itself upon us as ethically objective, is not anything to do with actions, but the terribleness of suffering. What makes something a tragedy is first and foremost the happening of serious evil to a being of worth, such as a human. Secondly, whenever we ask why some action is right or wrong, we find we are led back to reasons that are not themselves about actions, but concern the good and evil of those affected. For example, what makes the act of killing wrong is in the first place the evil of the death of the victim, rather than the actions violating some rule or being contrary to some virtue. That explains why the rule against killing can be relaxed in the case of killing in self-defence, since then there is a conflict between the evils of the death of the victim and the death of the attacker. That is a conflict not between actions. So what is ethics fundamentally about, if not actions? I'll come back to that. But first, things will be clearer if I take an interlude on casuistry. I'm sure some people are feeling uncomfortable with comparing ethics to a very abstract science like mathematics. Perhaps you're thinking like this. There are child geniuses in mathematics and music, but there aren't in literature and ethics. In ethics, you need long experience of life to reach wisdom and prudence if you're to give advice on moral problems. Otherwise, you'll take a seminary and deductive approach and try to deduce answers from fixed principles. Your advice will be worthless because you don't understand life. You'll all nod in agreement with that, especially if you're old. I agree with it too. But solving moral problems is not ethics. It's casuistry which means the solving of particular moral cases, especially ones where there are conflicting considerations on each side. Or rather, casuistry is ethics, but only one corner of it. Didn't I just tell you that working out what to do is not the central thing in ethics? Now, I love casuistry. The Catholic Church has a long history in it. It once virtually owned the subject, and its history goes back to manuals of confessors in the early Middle Ages. Seventy or eighty years ago, you could write in to the Australasian Catholic record, and Father Nevin would answer your tricky moral questions. Is it permitted to deliberately confess to a deaf priest? Of course not. That defeats one of the main purposes of confession. 
is a harder one. Is an excommunicate obliged to attend Mass? The answer is complex. That's a more relevant case than you would think. Ben Chifley, while Prime Minister, used to attend Mass but slip out before Communion because he was automatically excommunicated for having married in a Presbyterian church. When the 60s came and free thought reigned, casuistry was ditched as a dog-eared part of the old world order. But no sooner had casuistry gone out the window than it had to be reinvented as applied ethics. Business ethics and bioethics saved many a philosopher from unemployment. At first, people complained that philosophers were spending too much time on unlikely imaginary cases. Next thing, scientists were mixing human sperm with rat over and frozen embryos inherited fortunes when their parents died in a plane crash. You can't beat real life for throwing up unlikely imaginary scenarios. Now we're very concerned with healthcare allocation. If there's a shortage of intensive care beds, should I, as an older person with a shorter expected lifespan, give up my place for a younger person? The way Maximilian Kolbe in Auschwitz took the place of a married man with children. Difficult questions. That's all important, very important, but it's not core ethics. Casuistry stands to ethics as accountancy stands to number theory. Sure, to do complex accountancy and value companies takes maturity and it's not enough to be an expert in number theory. That's true, but it's a distracting platitude. It's the same in ethics. There are two things left to do. One is to tell you about equality in mathematics and ethics. And the other is to explain what is the foundational concept of ethics, what it is that ethics is most fundamentally about. These are connected. Let's start with equality. Whether you see mathematics and ethics as alike or not, you'll be aware that both have a lot to say about equality. As everyone knows, mathematics is full of equal signs and equations, perhaps too many for some tastes. Let's go back to the example of the stars. The point was that the six stars are equal, identical to one another as stars. Maybe at the physical micro level, they're not identical, but they're equally a visible star on the screen. That's why the two rows of three are equal to each other and the three columns of two are equal to one another. That's what creates the equality two times three equals three times two. I choose a second and last example of equality in mathematics because it's both one that everybody has some idea of and it's also a little like how equality works in ethics. It's about probabilities of dice. If you throw two dice and look at the two faces that come up, the total on them can be anything from two to 12. Two ones give you two, while two sixes give you 12. Here is a graph of the probabilities of getting each of the possibilities from two to 12. Take a moment to look it over. Read especially the numbers along the bottom, which are the possible totals. You can see that the totals in the middle, around seven, are more probable. They come out more often than the totals at the end, around two and 12. That calls for explanation. Why is that? The reason is that it's a consequence of equality the equality of individual pair outcomes, like two on the first die and four on the second. Here's a table of the 36 possibilities, each of which 
has an equal chance of occurring. Take a moment to look at them and to mentally add the two numbers in a few of the boxes. You can see now why equality of the basic 36 outcomes creates inequality in the chances of different totals. Some totals can be made up of basic outcomes in few ways, some in many ways. Pascal, who discovered these things in the 17th century, realised that he'd come across something surprising, that by use of equality, the variability of chance outcomes could be reduced to formula. He wrote, By thus uniting the demonstrations of mathematics to the uncertainty of chance and reconciling what seem contraries, it can take its name from both sides and rightly claim the astonishing title, The Geometry of Chance. Now, back to ethics. Possibly the most influential book on political ethics in the last 50 years is Rawls' Theory of Justice. His distinctive thesis is that adequate principles of justice are those which would be chosen by rational agents concerned to maximise their share of such things as rights and liberties, opportunities and powers, income and wealth, and a sense of one's own worth. They are to design the just system without knowing what position they will hold in it, thus behind a veil of ignorance, which is fair to everyone by putting them in the same initial position. His proposals were reasonable, like prioritising the worst off, and the ability of his simple axioms to generate them proved very popular. Everyone loves a model, especially one with deductions from principles of equality. Rawls says, echoing Pascal on probability, we should strive for a kind of moral geometry with all the rigour that that name connotes. Uh, he does admit we're not quite there yet. Appeals to the equality of persons are very powerful in ethics and politics. Equality before the law is a settled and deep principle, and the High Court of Australia in its Mabo decision gave that as the reason for overturning the doctrine of terra nullius. When it comes to healthcare allocation in a crisis, there's a strong commitment to equal rights for everyone. The system tries very hard not to depart from that, and so on. Now, I'm finally in a position to tell you what the foundational concept in ethics is. It's the worth of persons, and in particular, the equal worth of persons. That's what explains why the death of a human is a tragedy, while the explosion of a lifeless galaxy is just a firework. It explains what makes dilemmas dilemmas. Typically, different people's rights conflict. It explains why we are so strongly committed to equal rights and shocked by violations of that, like slavery. If you're wondering whether the principle of the equal worth of persons will solve all moral dilemmas, the answer is no. That would be like expecting Euclid's axioms of geometry to tell you how far it is to the shops. We're not doing casuistry here, but foundations of ethics. What it explains is why each side of a dilemma has moral weight. For example, in a case like self-defence, where the worth of the victim and the attacker come into conflict. Obviously, we need some story about what it is about humans that gives them moral worth. That's for another time. W. D. Ross wrote in 1930 that an act, qua fulfilling a promise, or qua effecting a just distribution of good, or qua returning services rendered, is prima facie right, is self-evident just like a mathematical axiom, or the validity of a form of inference is evident. 
The moral order expressed in these propositions is just as much part of the fundamental nature of the universe as is the spatial or numerical structure expressed in the axioms of geometry or arithmetic. In our confidence that these propositions are true, there is involved the same trust in our reason that is involved in our confidence in mathematics, and we should have no justification for trusting it in the latter sphere and distrusting it in the former. In both cases, we are dealing with propositions that cannot be proved, but that just as certainly need no proof. Since then, Many relativist and historicist currents have undermined that kind of robust belief in the absolute objectivity of ethical truths. They've insinuated that moral rules are all made up by evolution or society or the powerful, and hence we shouldn't believe them. Those currents of thought have had less success with undermining belief in mathematical truths. Well, no success. The mathematical structure of the universe is part of its fundamental and necessary nature, and the truths describing it are knowable with certainty. The parallels between mathematics and ethics suggest that the same can be said of the ethical structure of reality. That revives the essentials of Plato's view that mathematics is the ideal body of knowledge for preparing the soul to understand ethical truths. Well, Jim, thanks for sharing that fantastic talk with us. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate it, particularly those that didn't thanks. do very well um, at mathematics in school, um, me, me being one of them. But, um, but hopefully you can cl clarify a few things for us. So we've also got um, Bishop Richard Umbers. Bishop Richard, thank you for, for joining us for this Q&A session. Great to be here. Thank you. It's a Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. I was going to say. You who put the Zoom in Zumarin. Oh, aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Very good, very good. Um, well, let, let's let's get straight into it. Uh, I need, initially, I think uh, you know others might be wondering, but also just for myself, um, I think an explanation of, of what it means to to dem demonstrate truth or to demonstrate uh, a true principle uh, might might help us, uh, Jim. So, I mean, you know, for example, yes. differentiating between proof and demonstration. Let, let's perhaps yeah. start there. Tell, tell us a little bit how, how one does that. Yeah, there isn't any difference between proof and demonstration in the mathematical scheme of things. Okay. The model of it goes back to Aristotle and implemented in Euclid's Elements uh, over 2,000 years ago. And the basic idea is that there should be self-evident axioms, ideally few of them, that you can just see must be true. They're simple enough. And after that, you have step-by-step -step reasoning, perfect reasoning, to get a selection of theorems. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you can see that in real mathematics, a lot of the work is done a long way down the track. But for what we're doing, the weight lies on finding how you know the axioms. Where do you start? How do you know those basic things? And that was, I think, uh, where mathematics and ethics come together. And I gave some examples, like with the two by three equals three by two in mathematics. And I think that's typical of where you have to start with insight in mathematics. You can think of that as an axiom and you don't need to have derived it from something else. You just need intuition to, and thinking about it to see that that must be true. And uh, ma mathematics hopes to do that across the board. So uh, a lot of its work is very far from the axioms, but the simple things that you can see are necessarily are true are where we are, where we, are we are at the moment. And it's hard to give any story about that. You know, our intellects are just have this magic ability to look at that kind of simple structure, like three rows of two equals the same as, uh, sorry, yeah, three, three columns of two is the same things as two rows of three. There's no more story behind that. We're just smart. Our intellects do do that, and we can just see that that must be true. Okay, so so if I'm if I'm getting this correctly, it's sort of um, is this another way we 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 talk about? Uh, so I suppose if we're using for philosophy as a self-evident principle, it happens to be the case that our our minds or perhaps even reality is is structured that way. It's it's not a 
it's not something that we choose to construct. It's just it's, it's right. given. It's given in a sense. That's right. It's given, and uh, there's a, well, there's a lot of things out there in reality, but some of them are too hard for us. But uh, simple mathematics is not too hard for us. The reality is out there, and uh, we're smart enough to just get it. I guess cats and apes don't do that. It's a human ability. Okay. Well, just just a, can I um, yeah, can Bishop Bruce, you want to jump in there? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, in terms of of working out some of the limitations of this comparison between mathematics and ethics, Aristotle would see that there are different methods appropriate to the different content that we might be studying. So, when we're dealing with human acts, which is what ethics deals with. You can, there's a role to be played with phrenesis and also uh, a kind of certainty about some of those acts, which is not a mathematical certainty, it's more of a moral one. Uh, you're not going to get all the issues. And I guess in that sense, you know, if you have, take someone like Baruch Spinoza, who tries to set ethics up on those sorts of mathematical axioms, uh, you know, there would be, there would be a, 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 a perhaps a, a a building upon a more Cartesian understanding of reality rather than uh, one which is more in, in keeping with the traditional Greek thought on that. I, I'd, I'd be interested to see what you say to that. Uh, yes, well, fundamentally, I don't agree with that when it comes to the most fundamental things in ethics, though it is true about subtle things about human acts. In the talk, I actually denied the, the math, that ethics is about human acts at the most fundamental level, though, of course, there's a lot of it that is. And it's perfectly true, as Aristotle says, that you don't get the certainty of mathematics in the, uh, uh, in the um, look, looking at the subtleties of human acts. And when, uh, when you have to decide on a human act and there are many conflicting considerations, it's more like a legal question where there's uh, typically going to be a number of considerations and you need mature reflection. But the the, what I was talking about here is foundations of ethics, where I don't think that's needed. A, the fundamental thing in ethics is to appreciate there's another human out there that is uh, valuable. And uh, three to six-year-olds start getting that. They get the sense it's not fair because there's some kind of equality between different persons. So they're not very, they're not very subtle about uh, their notion of fairness, but they're on the right track. It's that kind of thing that is like mathematics, rather than the subtleties. Bishop Richard, did you want to did you want to follow up on, yes. on that again? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you also refer then um, uh, to the, I suppose, the objective nature of, of those ethics, and you 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 draw a distinction between ourselves and, and animals. Um, but empirical study into monkeys uh, in judging their concepts of fairness uh, when one gets a banana and the other one doesn't get a banana and then you know, there's a little play. I can understand, you know, like there is, you, you can go in terms of an evolutionary account of ethics, you know, a mathematician like Frege uh, makes great fun of that sort of psychologism, you know, where he talks about the evolution of, of numbers, you know, perhaps in the past before that, that two plus two is equal to five, uh, but now we're more efficient, you know, we see it's equal to three. Um, and he does go into that a lot. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering even about the, the, the mindset of uh, mathematicians who go into philosophy, whether there, there's a bias there towards this pure realm um, of, you know, a third kingdom, uh, a, a very platonic, you know, world of forms where everything's neat and tidy. Uh, what... What role? What role, really? You know, for for evolution in, in, in our yes, we admit that yeah. we we admit that we have a bias towards that uh, pure realm, and we think that other people could learn from it in appropriate areas. Uh, and some parts of ethics are appropriate areas, and some parts are, are aren't. So you remember, as you said, there's a sort of uh, fairness behaviour, or at least uh, empathy behaviour, in uh, monkeys. There's also arithmetic behaviour in monkeys. Uh, rats are quite good at counting. Uh, well, even fish. You, you can go a long way down the food chain and find some kind of arithmetic behaviour. But that's not to say that they can understand why 2 times 3 equals 3 times 2. 
that kind of intellectual understanding appears to be unique to humans, though, of course, there must be an evolution of it and that it must build on uh, early arithmetic behaviour and senses of size of aggregates and that kind of thing. So I think it's the same in ethics. Of course, we come equipped with some kind of ethical uh, predispositions, shall we say, but then what we want to do in philosophy is understand the nature of those. So I think that's where we should be looking at a pure realm and then come back later to think about um, mature judgments and so on. Uh, so if, I mean, if, we tr if we just try to do casuistry without a sense of the basics of ethics, well, anything could happen. Uh, we could also get all sorts of judgment in courts of appeal and so on. It's, uh, it's yeah, you, <laughs> you, you, like any other subject, you need to get back to the basics and think about them for a while, free of uh, mature judgments, subtleties, uh, things that, uh, things, uh, different, different considerations that trade off. Okay, um, I just I just had a, a question, of perhaps a further clarification. Then, and, and going back to this idea of of how we grasp what's given, or if you will, in mathematical language, an axiom. Uh, you use the example in in your talk of uh, human beings uh, having worth. You know, this is how you you concluded the talk. So, would I be right in in um, in gaining from from this that 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 is an, an axiom? a human and ethical axiom, if, if you will. Yes, I, I agree with that. And I okay. think the main, very much the main and central human axiom, uh, ethical axiom. Okay, so that's a main ethical axiom. So my question is where, um, you know, and perhaps perhaps you, you may have already answered this, but where is it then that that comes from or, or what, what would we do to further the explanation or try and investigate the, the implication. Well, why is why is that the case? Why is that, so yeah. yes, well, we should be we should be looking at looking for uh, uh, properties of humans that uh, on which that supervenes as the uh, right. What, as the, where does it come from? Uh, to say. So what is it? And we, we look around and we see some other things that don't seem to have that worth, like rocks. And then there's entities like cats that maybe we think have a vestige of it or something like that. Surely we can explain what the difference between rocks, cats and humans are in a way that will give us some sense of uh, what it is about humans. Right. And, uh, a, a very straightforward and uh, surely valuable answer to that is St Augustine's. He says that we're made in the image of God and the image of God is our rational nature which distinguishes us, distinguishes us from the beasts of the field. That's surely getting somewhere. There is mm. something about our rational nature. Of course, it needs a lot of thinking about what that means and what's included in it and so on. Mm. It's mm. on the right track, I think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that, that it's a, well, it's a very complex uh, question to, to try and work out with many dimensions. And we could do that by eliminating or comparing other beings, if, if you will, and then trying to say why, why it is that the human being has this particular worth. We might say that that's our bias. You know, we hear that argument a lot. We would say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, that sure. so, so that definitely come, comes into it. Um, but, yeah, but, but just, again, just to clarify, it does seem to be, or your claim is that like mathematics, and, again, if I'm understanding correctly, we, we sort of, so you used the example of bridges, the example of stars. We, we try to um, work out what it is that, that's absolute, what, what, what is necessary or what, what's a must. And so, despite these complexities in the, in to working out, you know, our, our place in the in the universe, if you will, uh, despite these complexities, there is a, a kind of reasoning to that that absolute principle that well, human beings do have inherent worth, or this is why we care so much about you know um, uh, murder or, or what have you. So, is that yeah, is that a kind of ju that's, just that's the idea? It's, right. Uh, where you say it's all very complex, I was. Hoping as a mathematician that actually it was very simple. <laughs> Maybe the, the, uh, different aspects to it. Right, sure. right. The sense of rationality, the worth of persons is, there's something simple about it as well. Okay. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, the three to six year old gradually gets the hang of that, that they themselves deserve justice because it's them, you know, it's, uh, mm. uh, they, and that they then see that by symmetry that other people are actually sort of the same and they, 
the fact that I deserve an ice cream maybe implies that they deserve an ice cream as well, which I remember being a bit of a shock when I, when I was that age. <laughs> when you first have to, to discover yeah. these principles of equality, that's yes, true. That's right. um, Bishop uh, Richard, do you have a, any follow-up on that for the time being or, or should, I, should I jump to another, another question? Well, you could probably, sort of, I mean, in the end, I guess I'd go off into a sort of, you know, what kind of Kantian foundations are there to, to what's being claimed. Um, mm, but, mm. I mean, Kant insofar as he was a Christian. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. That it is to some degree Kantian. Uh, but as I said, it's uh, you can find it in Augustine in in the basics as well, and it's uh, it's even uh, a basic uh, implication, I would say, of the sayings of Jesus that we should love our neighbours ourselves. Uh, why is that so? There must be something uh, the same about our neighbour and ourselves, surely. That's not true of uh, rocks and stones, animals. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it well, seems I mean, to... Just to, to, to raise the Peter Singer question. I mean, you know, he, he tries to expand the circle. And so, I mean, I, I have a difficulty, uh, various difficulties with what Singer has to say because I think there's a, an inherent flaw in his having to bob both ways and he appeals to rationality in some senses, but then says we need to move away from deciding things on the basis of consciousness or rationality and look more at, at pleasure and pain. Um, as a, as a, and in, in which case we're able to expand uh, uh, empathy and reasoning and, and, and concern for the other, that universalizability um, to uh, sentient animals. Um, now, I, 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 as I say, I think there is an inherent flaw there because he, he doesn't ever really uh, does away with the Cartesian understanding of, of consciousness and why when, when a fetus has consciousness or a child has consciousness, that makes a big difference as opposed to when a child doesn't. Um, but Jim, you, you may want to say yes. more on that. No, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, what Singer, the good thing about Singer is he makes very clear what his foundation of ethics is, and it's equality of interests or pleasures and pains. And he, he says they, those are equal, irrespective of, um, a, a, in abstraction from, any worth of the things that have them. So if you're comparing pigs and babies, you just count how many interests they've got and that's it. So the pig and the baby, the substances, don't have worth in themselves. So that's uh, simply a mistake, I think. So we should uh, look into what the correct uh, answer is and we should attribute worth to substances especially humans, and then look what it is about them, for example, rationality or their emotional life or individuality, there are various choices, not mutually exclusive, that uh, give them that worth. And then we might have an answer to Singer instead of just uh, talking a past him. Mm. Is part of the problem as well, uh, you know, I think illustrated there in the Singer example or in comparing how, how you would differ from, from you know, Singer's approach, uh, Jim, part of the, the issue is, um, I, I guess, one, um, well, I suppose it's a question, using maths as, a, as, as the axiom um, like, we, like we would do in ethics, um, I, I'm, I, I can, I'm continually intrigued by this idea of proof or verif- verifiability. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that um, that maths is like ethics, but unlike some of the natural sciences, right? So we don't get the same kind of the same kind of proof. Um, and some might even say, well, maths isn't really a science because of that that difference there yeah. I just pointed out. Uh, so yeah, so let, let's talk a little bit about how we we arrive here again at this verification. Well, yeah, in math in the mathematics world, we don't always call it a science. I mean. Right. We, we do when there's a grant going. Look, we do. We, <laughs> if there's a big grant for science, it's a science. Otherwise, it's a, uh, we, a unique subject in itself. Yeah, we don't call ourselves scientists exactly. Right. Because we think, and because we think we have a better method for establishing things. In science, you've got to have experimental evidence, and that's all there is in the end to establish the, the, the the truth that all swans are white, you have to go out and look at all, all the swans and uh, it, it works or it doesn't work. Right. 
Now, in mathematics, it's not like that. Uh, some experience can help you, uh, like in ethics, uh, tune up the concepts. And, uh, but in the end, it's pure thought that tells you what's right in mathematics. Okay. And, and attached to that is a, is a kind of logic as well, right? That's right. The logic yeah. is how to get from one to a place to another, from one proposition to another. And, uh, yeah, mathematics, we've had a lot of uh, experience over 2,000 years since Euclid on the details of logic and well, I think we, we claim we've got it right now <laughs> we can tell what follows from what okay well I mean is there any problem with uh proceeding uh simply with or, or looking at or any or, or anything that you can see that might be a bit of a challenge for maths or a mathematical approach to assessing ethics so I'm thinking you know we we it seems that um I got a lot of things in my maths exam wrong throughout the years um so so is that is is that similar to how because you know some someone might say well okay well that's all well and good human human beings have dignity or 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 there's justice or you know we should we should sort of give a a due justice or consideration for due justice but but we don't right that's the kind of typical response We, we don't do that as human beings so from a from a mathematical approach or otherwise are we assessing that as a as a mistake then that they're making mistakes um, yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, I wouldn't say mistakes in ethics right. are much like mistakes in mathematics. Well, as I was saying, you should think of mathematics on a foundation, uh, sorry, in ethics in the foundational aspect and then in the casuist, casuistry aspect, right. you get the right answer over on a dilemma or something. Now, uh, um, um, ethical mistake in the foundations is more like a kind of psychopathy that you don't think other people are worth something and they're just uh, your they're just tools for your gratification or your power your increase your power or whatever and of course there are people like that and they're not making a kind of mistake like peter singer is making the, the, his kind of mistake is more like um uh, well actually I'm, I'm sorry we said we said that uh, he made a mistake in the foundations but a different one but uh, then other kinds of ethical mistakes are just getting the wrong uh, balance in a dilemma. So this is if you're in a very difficult position like triage when there's uh, mm. limited medical resources, well, different people are going to make uh, different decisions and some of those might be wrong. So. But it's, uh, that's more like uh, failing to balance properly something complex. Okay. And that's a bit more like uh, failing to evaluate an argument correctly in a court of law. You, find, you think that uh, somebody is proved guilty beyond reasonable doubt when the evidence, in fact, doesn't reach that. Hmm. Bishop Richard? So to, to perhaps um, raise some more sophist-type challenges uh, <laughs> at the complex end of things, uh, I mean, in mathematics, you know, you have those sorts of difficulties like Russell's paradox. I don't know whether an equivalent would be Gettier problems in in philosophy in terms of uh, uh, dilemmas of justification. Uh, what what you know what what do you have to say? I mean, there, there are in, in, in contemporary ethics, especially virtue ethics, you seek to overcome those sorts of challenges by situating the locus of justification in, in characteristics of the agent. Um, rather than just in the act itself, which was would seem to be the case with a mathematical approach to underpinning uh, those that, that kind of objective ethics? Uh, yeah, well, in my mathematical approach, I wasn't concentrating on acts. Remember, it started with the worth of persons, which has nothing to do with et- acts. But, yeah, to take up virtue ethics, I think it's unfortunate to uh, think of virtues in abstraction from the acts that they're virtues about. I mean, to, to, to read some of the people on virtue eth- ethics, you wouldn't think that the point of action is to create some consequences. Uh, surely surely ju- the point of justice is not to uh, make your, char- your ju- character more just. It's to uh, cause just decisions to be made. There, there has to be an orientation of virtues towards acts, which I think is forgotten about often in virtue ethics. Mm, I see. Um, uh, having uh, having said that, though, there is uh, there is there is something a little more complex than I'm pretending when you t- start talking about the worth of persons, because uh, if you ask 
what does that imply about, say, a right to education? Well, it doesn't imply anything until you've said something about the nature of the human person, because the, the reason you have a right to education is that part of being a person is uh, rationality, and hence that's something that deserves to be developed. So there is actually a fair bit to say on top of worth of persons about the nature of humans, and in that case, you're getting towards natural law ethics. Mm. Who, who is the um, author of Romulus, My Father? Raymond Gator. Yeah, do you sympathise with his, his uh, approach? Uh, yes and no. I sympathise with the part of the approach, and I've been actually very impressed with it, that ethics is very serious. And his earlier book, which I think should be taken more notice of, is uh, called Good and Evil, an Absolute Conception. And while I'm also all in favour of an absolute conception, now, it's just unfortunate that he, he is also anti-foundationalist because he grew up in Melbourne where they had too much Wittgenstein in the, in the 60s. So, uh, no, uh, so he, he's very serious and absolutist about ethics, which is good, but he doesn't think there ought to be any foundations, which is bad. Mm, okay. I want to go back to a question of, of foundations again. You can see I'm, I'm niggling here at the, at the seams of foundations, but... Uh, I, I'm actually really interested in in because I'm not sure I, I was able to grasp it um, from from your talk. It's definitely my my deficit. Um, but I I was wondering, mathematics is it the case that it that it it comes before in a formal sense anything that that we can you know then deduce or make our way to materially, or is it something that we that from the material we can work out mathematical or what's the relationship there between these kind of abstract things that you're working out in, you know, as I close my eyes and I tried to see that cube, you know, I, I kept thinking to myself, well, isn't it because there are things in nature again, in a way that are given that I can see that cube. So yeah, I'd like you to maybe just spend a couple of minutes on, on that. I'm relationship. you asked that question because I wrote a book about it, <laughs> an Aristotelian realist philosophy of mathematics. Right. And it says that, uh, Mathematics is about something real, but things that can be realised in the real world. So it's not Platonist. So the way I spoke, I didn't go into this and I thought of uh, the, uh, mathematics as, and as being about a platonic entities, but really it isn't. It's about properties like symmetry and continuity and ratio that uh, can be realised in the real world. And you're right, when you're imagining a cube, uh, and a physical cube has those properties of symmetry as well as the imagined one. So that is, that is the remarkable thing about mathematics, just by sitting down and thinking in the armchair and as if you're dealing with platonic entities in another world, you reach truths that are true in this world of physical entities. That's incredible. Mm, it is. But, is. but is it always the case, is, is my, my question, that you do... You, can you make, for example, um, yeah, just just mistakes of perhaps to use some Aristotelian language here, a mistake in logical being, you know, as as opposed to real being, you know, what what are the kind of issues oh, there? That... Issue. Um, <laughs> well, you, we're all we're not we're none of us really that smart. Of course, we can always <laughs> make mistakes. Right. There's lots of ways to be mis to make mistakes. There's mistakes in intricacies like details like uh, you a bug in a computer program but then as Aristotle says it's hard with simple things too because they're bright like the sun and you can get confused that way so the uh, possibilities of making mistakes are infinite I'm not sure I can right no no, no no that's okay I mean I just I just wondered because you know when you were saying that you can it it, it does seem to work that you can imagine something logically or work it out logically and then that apply to you know the real real things in the real world right but but i'm just concerned i suppose from an ethical point of view when when we do um think that that the logical workings out of something can apply to to real situations so is is, is that not a concern well, as well yeah, if, you've right, if you've done it right they right. Will. But right of course our imagination is a somewhat limited faculty you often find it easy to imagine things that are actually not possible, mm. like some juries we could mention. Like a duck rabbit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
but so the imagination is can go wrong when you start getting too complex. And in that case, that's what we have proof for because it breaks down that into steps. So the idea of a proof is that you don't have to grasp the whole thing whole. You can break it down into a lot of steps, each of one it's obvious, and you have a chain of deductions, each of them sound, that mm. gets you from something non-obvious to some, something obvious and through obvious steps to something non-obvious. Like that's what the proof of Pythagoras' theorem is about. No one can see that Pythagoras' theorem is always true, but if you follow sufficiently many steps, you can say, yeah, yeah, they all, they all check out. There's nothing wrong. But where the start was good, each step was good, it must be right. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I, have a, I have probably just one more question, but Bishop Richard, did you, did you want to jump in on, on any of that at this stage? Um, again, coming from completely left field, mm. uh, voluntarist understandings, so we were talking about foundations of ethics, and, and ultimately, I mean, there's an understanding of, uh, I mean, you're, you're talking about human beings who are rational. As Christians, we would say made in the image and likeness of God. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, we would, we would talk about a participation, our understanding of, of these things, the reason why we're able to, um, to read the situation is because of synderesis and, and that the moral law for ourselves is a participation in that eternal law determined by God. Um, they, I mean, the medievals uh, would argue nonstop about the will of God and the autonomy of God, and I suppose the, the, the omnipotence of God, especially people like Ockham, uh, where mathematics would be a plaything uh, for God. And certainly a lot of medievals talk a lot about you know, the, the unknowingness of God and the very apathetic things. <coughs> uh, how would you respond to that, I mean, I, I've been taking it that, that uh, you'd be very opposed to, to that style of, uh, of talking about God being a God beyond God, uh, yeah. as they would tend to, to put, yeah. put things. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, along with many people, that there's no opportunity for God to make two plus two equal five because there's no that doesn't describe any possibility on which he could, so to speak, confer being. And all the truths of mathematics are beyond God's control, I, I would uh, argue that. Even uh, he can't make the millionth digit of pi other than what it is. Uh, and I would say the same about ethics, that uh, if God creates humans as they are, he couldn't create, at the same time, create them worthless and make it quite all right to kill them. It's because if the worth of persons follows from their nature. Of course, that, it's, that nature might be conferred by God and he's conferred being on that nature. But having done that, there's no opportunity for him to, uh, uh, fail, to create, fail to uh, recognise, if perhaps is the word, the, the arising worth. Mm. Bishop Richard, did you want to jump in again or uh, otherwise I had a... Well, just, the, I mean, that, that first work by Plato, um, that dilemma that, that Socrates has to deal with. Uh, who's the fellow he meets on the way to the market? I can't do you, remember. Do you remember? No. That's, no. It's, it's, a, it's a very short work by Plato. I, I can't believe I've forgotten the name of the guy. Um, it's the, the classic dilemma uh, place. You know, are, the, are, is, are things right because the gods make them so or are the, the gods make them so because they're right? You know, that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I certainly go for the side that uh, they're right and uh, God recognises that. But so, and so the dilemma placed by atheists is to say, well, therefore mathematics is actually greater than God. But I think you've already determined, you've already answered that by talking about God creating the nature. So having created that nature, he then respects the nature. That's right. But and, and I, so from a Christian perspective, for the, the simple, divine simplicity, God's knowing and willing uh, uh, and being are one of the same thing. It's just our way of knowing kind of makes those distinctions. That's right. But then again, God can only create a, a universe uh, according to mathematical principles. He can't choose different ones. And it seems a little strange to call that a constraint on God because there isn't, there isn't a, an alternative that he could have created being. Uh, Euthyphro. Sorry, I was thinking of Euthyphro. Euthyphro. Yeah, Euthyphro. Euthyphro. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, and the, yeah, the same with ethics. There's, uh, there's no opportunity for God to command that uh, killing people is quite all right in general uh, because uh, it isn't. And for the same reasons arising from the nature of persons that uh, the truths of mathematics arise from the nature of mathematics. I, I have a part of the, the aims of a scholarship at the cathedral, and Bishop Bridget could attest to this. is is certainly <clears throat> engaging in an educational sense, which is why I, I really did enjoy the the three part format of, of the talk. Um, again, for someone who's who's um, doesn't have a, a very deep background at all in mathematics, but I am I am actually interested in in um, one of one of the claims in in the talk as well, Jim, which was. Um, in terms of mathemat ma mathematics serving as a preparation for, for ethics, that really got me thinking, okay, now how is it that, that, that that's going to happen? You know, because you did also point out that um, you can have a genius in, in mathematics uh, and, you know, and, they, and they can kind of get how to, how to do maths yet not know how to act ethically. Um, so how is it that we're going to do that? Or what would be your suggestions in the, you know, in the education system as, 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 of how to draw them more closely together, because I, well, I would assume they're not always drawn close they're, together. They're typically not. I'm not mm. sure you should exactly draw them together. Mm. It's just that when teaching mathematics, you should call attention to uh, the nature of the subject and that it's told you about some absolutely certain truths. And uh, you might like to hint that uh, relativist uh, objections and uh, now the whole naturalist thing that is so big that it must be an evolutionary story to everything, and it could have been otherwise. Well, this is not going to wash in mathematics, and you can hint that maybe uh, the same applies in ethics. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in terms of um, you know including mathematics in in, a, in, a, in an educational curriculum for those who are doing you know philo uh, philosophy or you know ethics or um, I mean. I'm that, that sounds like something in the Middle Ages, doesn't it? <laughs> did you, did you, yeah, but, but, yeah, the, middle, the medieval quadrivium did exactly that. It dragged, it dragged the humanist scholars of the day through astronomy, musical theory, uh, arithmetic and geometry. Uh, that's fantastic. We should bring that back immediately. <laughs> okay. I'm sure some people are, uh, you know, would be echoing the same thing. Well, that's, that's all uh, there is for me. Bishop Richard, did you have any, any final, final follow-ups? No. Okay, well, um, Professor Jim Franklin, I'd love to thank you for your time and your talk. Uh, it's, it's been it's been fun doing this, and, and hope we can continue to do this in the in the new online format. You know, the new way of the world as it is. That's the way. Um, and I hope you both uh, in, have have an enjoyable afternoon. I hope our viewers uh, also enjoyed the, the talk. We'll be bringing you further uh, uh, scholarship at, at the cathedrals down the track, uh, and you know, follow the Facebook and the and the website as well to to um, to keep abreast of those uh, those updates. Uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Bishop Richard. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much.